Bottled water is an incredibly lucrative business. We all need water to survive, it's good for us, and for so many of the bottling companies throughout the United States, it can be incredibly cheap to acquire and bottle, allowing them to sell it for ridiculously high markups. Given that the vast majority of municipalities supplied tap water in the United States is safe to drink, you'd think that bottled water would have a hard time competing, but it's actually doing better than ever. In fact, 2016 was the first year ever that Americans drank more bottled water than soda, with the average person drinking approximately 30 gallons of bottled water every year. So how did the bottled water industry take off to such incredible heights? Like, subscribe, and stick around to find out as we learn something new. The Holy Well bottling plant in the United Kingdom was the first water bottling plant in the world. It is widely believed that the selling of bottled water began at the plant in 1622. The practice would soon spread to other areas in Europe with many mineral springs beginning to bottle and sell their water. The main reason for this was the perceived medicinal value of the spring water, often sold for its medicinal value in many pharmacies in Europe until the 1900s. And this would be mirrored in America as early as the 1760s, when a company called Jackson's Spa in Boston decided to take the natural spring water they usually provided to visitors to drink and bathe in, believing it would cure them of many common ailments, and bottle it, selling it to nearby communities and allowing visitors to take water home with them. This practice would only grow larger as newer, cheaper, more mass-producible glass bottles from molds were created. By 1856, Saratoga Springs in New York, one of the most popular water sources at the time, produced 7 million water bottles per year. One entrepreneur of the 1850s, E.W. Stevenson, promised that his water drawn from a well in Ontario could cure everything from dyspepsia, liver and kidney complaints, to seasickness, fever, and even malaria. A pint of water at this time was fetching up to $1.75. An increasing typhoid and cholera outbreaks led many Americans to depend on bottled water as a safer and healthier option, still believing the water also had medicinal properties from its natural sources. But it was also in the mid to late 1800s that bottled water was becoming popular as an image and status symbol, being perceived as clean and stylish. But just as bottled water was taking off, someone stepped in and changed everything. John Leal, who was a doctor in New Jersey, developed a method of treating municipal water supplies with chlorine. When water disinfection methods like this chlorination were discovered as effective preventionary methods for the typhoid epidemic, bottled water started losing its popularity, and tap water began its reign of supremacy. By 1920, most municipalities were providing free chlorinated water in the form of public water fountains. The public health benefits were obvious. Half of the decline in urban deaths between 1900 and 1940 can be attributed to improvements in water quality, according to the National Bureau of Economic Research. By as early as 1930, bottled water, remarkably, had become something that was low class, only used in offices and factories that couldn't afford plumbing. But after several decades of people across the country implementing and enjoying clean, typhoid-free tap water, a new invention would enter the picture that would usher in the bottled water industry that we see today. This was plastic bottles. They first started being used in 1947, but like with any new invention, they didn't have it quite figured out right away. The bottles tended to be relatively expensive, to the point where most people didn't see the point in buying, especially when they had tap water at home and public water fountains when they were out and about. By the early 1950s, however, high-density polyethylene started being used as a much cheaper alternative. And still, nobody really cared. In the 1970s, just 350 million gallons of bottled water were being sold in the United States, about a gallon and a half per person per year. And much of that came in the big five-gallon jugs that were used in office water coolers. The rest made up a niche market of mineral waters bottled from natural springs. But one of the niche competitors decided to get serious about making bottled water into a phenomenon. The French company Perrier had been selling sparkling natural spring water since the mid-1800s, but had been limited to selling in high-end restaurants for decades. In 1977, they hired an ex-Special Forces officer and former Levi Strauss executive named Bruce Nevins. 
They wanted him to relaunch the brand in the American market, wanting to keep its premium branding but expanding its consumer base beyond restaurants. Perrier played off a growing desire for status, as the corporate world was growing its prevalence in big cities. Health concerns played an important role, too. Amid a wave of media coverage of studies linking saccharin, the artificial sweetener used in many diet sodas, with cancer, which I covered in a previous video that will be linked at the end of this video, Nevins positioned pure Perrier as a healthy alternative to soft drinks, and it worked better than anyone could have predicted. Perrier's American sales rocketed from 3 million bottles in 1975 to roughly 200 million just four years later. In 1980, the Perrier Group purchased Poland Springwater, its biggest U.S. rival, giving the firm an 85% share of what was then called the bottled Springwater market. They now had a stranglehold on the entire market. So why aren't they as prevalent now? Well, in 1990, their reign came to an end, when bottles were found to contain benzene, which is detrimental to your health in the short term and potentially cancerous in the long term. A mass recall was put into effect, and trust with the brand was shattered, leaving the door open for others to step in, namely Nestle, which acquired Perrier in 1992 along with other brands. And after a parasitic outbreak in the Milwaukee water system in 1993, the companies found a new angle to try and get consumers. Despite the International Water Association's voluntary code of standards dictating that advertisements should not exploit consumer fears about the safety of public drinking water supplies, the companies were quick to tout how much cleaner their water was, despite much of it coming from municipal water supplies. Health officials at the time pushed back, pointing to Perrier's benzene contamination incident as evidence that the bottled water industry was hardly immune to contamination issues, but it was already catching on. Pepsi was the first soft drink company to join the water game. Craig Wethrop, the president and CEO of Pepsi-Cola North America, told the Associated Press in 1994, when you reach for a beverage, we'll be there, marketing its brand Aquafina in 1994. Coke was soon to follow after seeing the bottled water sales growing at 30% each year. But as the industry grew, the marketing seemed to become a little less genuine. Ozarka went from being bottled in the Ozarks to Springs in East Texas. The California brand Yosemite Waters was actually pumped from a well in Orange County. In 2006, a corporate watchdog organization called Corporate Accountability International launched a campaign against bottled water, summarized in a great YouTube video that I'll link in the description of this video. While bottled water does have its uses, being a lifesaver for many after natural disasters or when real problems with municipal water supplies arise, like in Flint, Michigan, for the majority of people in first world countries, it tends to not be necessary at all. Your city is likely testing the water supply hundreds of times a month, whereas bottled water companies test their water at most once a week. You can type your zip code and water analysis report into a search bar and likely find a report that states what's in your water and what safe levels are. Even if you aren't comfortable with what you find, in most cases, adding a decent filter to your faucet is the best way to get clean, safe water without paying anywhere from a 300 to 20,000% markup. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, subscribe for more like it. And don't forget to check out my video on the history of artificial sweeteners like saccharin. Thanks again, and I will see you next time.